Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this uh, cool, windy day. Glad that you're here. Let me go through just a few announcements that we have for this morning, and then we'll, we'll get right into our worship service. Uh, first of all, welcome those of you that might be visiting with us today. Glad you're here. Those of you that are joining us on the live stream, welcome to you. Let me remind you that out there in the narthex where you came through, you'll find uh, our weekly prayer list. Copies of that are available so that you can use that to pray for each other throughout the week. Uh, our offering plates are out there. If you brought an offering today, you'll also find other materials, devotionals, and pocket crosses, and things like that. So make sure you grab uh, those things when you leave this morning. Uh, let me remind you that next Sunday, 
We have our fellowship luncheon after worship, and it's Super Sunday. So uh, we're asking you to please bring a soup to share with everyone. Bring a crock pot full of soup. It's always one of the luncheons that we look forward to as people bring uh, their great stuff to share. So bring a uh, soup to share and a dessert. That would be great. We also use that Sunday as a Sunday to collect for the missions uh, ministry, uh, cans of soup, as well as pairs of socks. And we make sure those get to the hands of Hope Food Pantry. Um, and so if you pl can, please bring cans of soup uh, for the ministry and uh, socks as well. And we'll gather those next Sunday before the luncheon. Uh, today, following worship, we have our church annual meeting. And uh, I know you're all looking forward to that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, glad that you can come and be a part of that. It's an important piece of who we are and how we function as a, a congregation. We make important decisions. We vote on our budget. We elect new lay leaders from the congregation. We uh, consider things that the council brings before us. So uh, if you can, please plan on staying today. Following worship, we'll take a few minutes to grab some refreshments and have a little bit of fellowship, but then we'll come right in. We have a nice full schedule for the annual meeting. So uh, if you're able, please stick around today for the annual meeting. We do have communion this morning, and uh, as is our custom, uh, we want to make it very clear that everyone is welcome to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, not just those who are members of our church, but anyone who proclaims Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is welcome to receive the sacrament. We will be passing uh, the sacrament through the aisles today instead of coming forward, uh, and so when we get to that point, if you would just hang on to the bread until everyone has received it, and then we will eat of it together, and the same with the cup. And I'll give you a little reminder when we get to that point. And finally, you see we have some beautiful flowers here in the sanctuary this morning. And those flowers are presented by Pat Forrest in loving memory of his son Mike, who uh, passed away a few weeks ago. We've been praying for Pat and for his family during this challenging time. And uh, Pat, thank you for the beautiful flowers this morning. I'm going to invite the choir to come forward now and lead us into worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletins. I'll read the light print, ask that you respond with the bold. Lord God, through Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind, you healed the sick, and you fed the hungry. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Loving Father, by the Spirit, you restore strength to the weary and give hope to those who are in despair. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. You call us, Lord, to proclaim your deeds and your wonders to all people. You call us to worship and serve you so that all may be made whole. You offer us a new life of righteousness. 
We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Make us worthy, O Lord, to receive all your gifts. Descend on us like the dawn of a new day and give light to our souls. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. If you take out your hymnals now, you're going to need to put fingers in a couple places in the hymnal here for this. We're going to start with number 509, and on the other side of the page is 510, and that's a Holy Ground medley. And then we're going to slide, when we're done with that, right over to 503 for the chorus, Be Still and Know. join your voices with mine in the prayer of invocation. It's printed there in your bulletin. Let us pray together. God of all power, you are the one who called this world into being, and we acknowledge that you have no equal. Yet you want to share your strength with those who are powerless. You ache to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up the wounds of the lost and rejected of this world. Such radical love leaves us speechless, but you gave it human form in the person of Jesus, in whom your promises of healing and empowerment were fulfilled. We give you thanks and praise for blessing our lives in this way, and we pray that in Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can become radical lovers of the powerless and passionate bearers of hope to those whose lives are filled with despair. May this time of worship be a true expression of our desire to praise and glorify you for the many ways in which you bless us. And may our lives reveal our gratitude in all we think 
and do and say. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take out the scripture insert sheet, you'll find there, as Tom comes forward to read the word of God to us this morning. Good morning. Good morning Tom. The Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of this, his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 32 through 39. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated, everyone, and at this time, the children can head downstairs for Sunday school.
If you want to take out that scripture insert sheet again, we'll read the New Testament lesson for today. It comes, from us, uh, comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 20, uh, verses 20 through 24. And uh, just like the entire book of Acts, we're in the very beginning of the early church. It's trying to help us understand not only what took place, but how it took place. How did this uh, early church grow? How did it become? How did it move and gather and all of those things? And seemingly, there's not much here in this passage, but it also has a lot to say. From Acts 20, this is Paul. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, to God. Thanks be to God. When we look at the book of Acts and we uh, try to get a grasp on how this movement became the established church that we know of it today, how did it go from these 12 guys following Jesus around and him being crucified, and then word spreading that he's raised from the dead. How did it go from that to hundreds and thousands of people, not just there in Jerusalem, but all over the Roman Empire, believing? And along the way, we get these little snippets that tell us how the church grew. So in Acts chapter 2, we read these simple words. It says, this is how they did it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers got together. They had everything in common. They sold their property. They sold their possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And we're told, the Lord added to their number daily 
those who were being saved. That's how they did it. It's a pretty unique marketing campaign, isn't it? This is how the church went from basically next to nothing to becoming this thing, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, in those first early years, they faced persecution from the Jewish religious leaders, right? This was a sect of Jews that believed in this new prophet, Jesus, and they were saying things that just didn't seem to, to jibe with what the religious leaders of the Jewish movement felt was, uh, was kosher, if we can use that word, and so they persecuted. And that's actually where we meet Paul for the first time. He's Saul, and he participates with the stoning of Stephen. He's one of these people who goes out looking for these Christians, these believers of Jesus. Those early years are filled with nothing but persecution. And then once the Jewish religious leaders have been persecuting them for a while, the Roman leaders, political leaders, start to recognize that these Christians are popping up all over the empire. It's not just in Jerusalem. They're popping up over here in, in Ephesus and in Philippi and in Corinth and, and even in Rome itself. And so the Roman Empire start persecuting these early Christians. If you want to have a good idea of what it was like for the early church, all you have to do is look at the original 12 disciples. We'll, call, we'll actually look at the original 11. We'll take Judas out of the picture. He's gone pretty much right away. But we know that Simon Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. That's how he testifies to being a follower of Jesus Christ. He ends up being crucified, martyred in Rome. Andrew, who's Peter's brother, he goes to Greece to, to preach, and he's crucified in a town called Patras, Greece. James, who's the son of Zebedee, was probably the first apostle to be martyred. He was beheaded just about 10 years or so after Jesus resurrected by King Herod Agrippa right there in Jerusalem. John is probably the only one that wasn't martyred. He was sent off into exile where he dies uh, many years later. Philip was crucified in what is today Turkey. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, was martyred in horrible ways when he went to preach the good news in India. Matthew goes to Ethiopia to spread the good news, and he's killed while he's there. Thomas also goes to India, where he's martyred. James, son of Alphaeus, is martyred right there in Jerusalem with some of the other believers. Thaddeus goes to Mesopotamia and Persia, which is today Iran, where he's beaten to death by a crowd as he preaches. Simon the Zealot is also martyred in possibly what is today Britain. Every one of these disciples of Jesus within 20 to 30 years of the resurrection is dead. Not in a very pleasant way either. This is kind of the, the badge of the early Christian church. The early Christian church is marked by martyrdom. People who are persecuted and give their lives in faithful devotion to Jesus. And then something happens. Something happens once we get to the year 312. So we're going to have a little history lesson now. You ready for this? Here we go. By the time we get to the year 300 or so, the Roman Empire, as we think of it, is broken into two pieces. We have an Eastern Roman Empire, and we have a Western Roman Empire, and they both have kind of emperors that rule them. And every once in a while, they'll fight each other to try to bring things together. And for those 300 years of that portion of the church, Christians have been killed in every horrible way possible that you can imagine. And you've heard the stories. They're fed to the lions. They fight the gladiators. They're used as human torches for some of the emperor's terrible things that happen in the empire. In every way possible, Christians are persecuted and killed for their faith. And the crazy thing is, as that happens, as they don't renounce their faith, more people come to faith. 
And the Romans don't know what to do about this. The more they persecute, the more the Christians are forced underground to worship in the catacombs and, and things like that, the more people recognize that there's something real about this. And the more people come to faith. Until we get to the year 312. There's a guy, he's, he's a pretty humble guy. He calls himself Constantine the Great. As soon as you put the word the Great after your name, it tells a lot about a person. Constantine is in charge of the eastern side of the Roman Empire. But that's not good enough for him. He wants it all. He wants it all. So he takes his forces, his army, and he starts marching towards Rome where he is going to battle uh, Maxentius, who's the emperor of the western side of things. And they come to this one place. It's known as the Milvian Bridge. And they're about to have this grand battle. And it's really not clear who is going to win, who's more powerful, or anything like that. And Constantine, uh, a day or two before this great battle, has a dream at night. And in this dream, he looks up into the sky and he sees the cross of Christ. This persecuted group of people. He's persecuted them. Maxentius has persecuted them. But here's this cross of of Christ just hanging there and he hears this phrase and then he sees it actually written on the cross and in Latin in hoc signo vinces meaning in this sign you will conquer or if you want to brief it down conquer by this and he watches as that cross turns upside down slowly and turns into a sword. And when he awakes, he comes to the conclusion that this is a message from this God of the Christians. That if he will become a believer and follower, God will give him the strength of the sword to defeat all his enemies. And so the next day, he makes an order that everyone in his army is to put the sign of Jesus on their, on their banners and on their tunics and everything. And they go out and they fight the battle under the banner of Christ. And they win. And one of the first things he does is he pronounces an, an edict. It's called the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which basically says Christians can no longer be persecuted. Christians are now okay. Christians are now accepted. No more feeding them to the lions. No more fighting them with the gladiators. No more lighting them on fire or all the other horrible things that we did to them. Christians are now okay. And even actually more than that, um, I'm siding with the Christians. Now, interesting enough, uh, history tells us that Constantine wasn't a Christian. He did get baptized as he was dying on his deathbed many years later. Um, he wanted to make sure he was covered, um, but his life was not led as a Christian. But he proclaimed that his empire was following the Christian God. And so literally, almost overnight, Christianity becomes the God of the oppressed, uh, I mean the religion of the oppressed, the religion of the persecuted, the religion of the martyred, to the official religion of of the Holy Roman Empire with Constantine at its head. And Constantine starts bringing together all these Christian leaders from all over the Roman Empire to make decisions on what Christianity is really about. And so they have these great gatherings where they make decisions on who Jesus really is, who can be a priest and who can't. Sorry, women, you're not allowed now. Who can be a leader? Who can't be a leader? What the hierarchy will be? What the structure will be? All those sort of things happen as we think of them today under Constantine. Overnight, the church goes from a group of people trying to be faithful to the ways of Jesus, meeting in the catacombs under Rome, meeting in hiding in all these other cities, to now they're the ones that get to walk around freely they're the ones that get to move into the temples of these old gods and turn them into new temples. They're the ones that get to take over all the religious celebrations and turn them into Christian celebrations and Christian holidays and Christian holy days. They are the ones that now have all the power. And that's not a good thing. 
Because for the next 2,000 years, we've seen what has happened when the church has rooted itself in earthly power, in earthly wealth, in earthly greed. It will take no time at all before Christians start killing other Christians. Happens right away. Happens right away as they start to argue over the minutia of what's real in faith and what's not real in faith. And so now, instead of the Roman Empire burning Christians at the stake, we have Christians burning other Christians at the stake. And that will lead us in all sorts of ways. We'll have crusades where we will go to reclaim the holy places of Jesus and we will see armies going and they didn't care who they killed. Most of the times they actually killed other Christians who were Arab and just dressed differently than them and they didn't know. We have the famous crusade that was made up of tens of thousands of children that were blessed by the Pope to go and fight for the Holy Land. And of course, they either were all killed or sold off into slavery. Just little kids. We'll have the Inquisition, where we're going to take that sword of Christ and root out anyone who's opposed to it. Europe will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of holy wars on their soil. That some, if you follow and read, would argue that goes all the way up in some ways to what was taking place in World War II at the time. Now, along the way, of course, throughout history, there have been faithful people and faithful movements who've tried to reject that. Who've tried to reject that marriage of the church to earthly power and earthly wealth and earthly greed. And instead of tried to seek the ways of Jesus... And some of those are the saints that we think about in the history of the church. Or some of the movements who just said, no, this isn't right. Even Martin Luther, where we get our uh, kind of connection from, to, to gather from the Reformation, it only came to pass because he aligned himself with princes and kings in Germany who were willing to, to back Luther so that they could take some of that earthly power from the Pope and claim it for themselves. One of that strands that kind of rejected that earthly power and wealth, and there's plenty of them, but one of those strands are our forebears, which seems uh, appropriate on today when we're having our annual meeting. This movement called pietism that looked at this this, uh, connection between the things of the world and the things of the church and said, how far we've come from the early church and what was important. How far we've come from Acts 2. We need to return to it. And so they started gathering together. They called them conventicles. Just these small groupings of people where they could read and devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship with each other. Where they could break bread, where they could pray where they could think about the needs that existed around them and try to find ways to make a difference. They had this wonderful phrase that we say from time to time here that is just so perfect. They said, God's glory and neighbor's good. That's what we're after. God's glory and neighbor's good. We're not after these massive cathedrals that are decked out in gold and incense and artwork and all that stuff. We're not looking for greed and we're not looking for money and for power. We're looking for ways to be faithful to what Jesus has taught us. And so those pietists that we come from focused on that. That's the example that they wanted to seek. God's glory and neighbor's good. It's so far away from a cross that has been turned upside down into a sword. Now maybe you you think... That's, that's so long ago. That's, that doesn't mean anything. Take out your hymnals for a second. Take out your blue hymnals there. Do me a favor. Turn to number 466. Bet this is a hymn that you're all familiar with. Let's just look at these words for a second. 466. Onward, Christian soldiers, 
marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe, forward into battle, see his banner go. Onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. How many of you sang that in church when you were young? I know I did. On to battle. Jesus before us with the cross turned into a sword so that we can defeat our foes. It's still a part of our mindset. How could we possibly look at the gift of the communion table where Christ humbles himself sacrifices himself, gives himself out of grace and out of mercy, gives his own blood and his own body, and yet think that Jesus goes before us with the cross as a sword to lead us into battle against our foes. Turn to number 616. Because to me, this one sounds a lot more like the early church. It sounds a lot more like the ways of Jesus that we read about. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. One of the challenges that the church of Jesus Christ faces today in our culture, in our world, is that oftentimes it seems like the cross of Christ is more a sword than it is the cross. Our example of what we should be doing in the world is much more aligned with Simon of Cyrene, who is pulled out of the crowd and carries Jesus' cross than it is David versus Goliath, us versus the world, where we can whip out our slingshot and kill some mighty enemies. Holy communion is about humility. It's about sacrifice. It's about love. It's about grace. It's about mercy. Here we find strength, not to defeat foes, but to live as Christ lived. Here we find strength so that we might seek the lost and the hungry and those in need. Here we find the strength to sacrifice as Christ has sacrificed for us. Here we find the courage to die to self, not only as Christ died to self, but as the early church died to self. Here, we release power, and we release greed, and we release ambition, and we release judgment, and we receive the gifts of grace and mercy so that we can bring gifts of grace and mercy. One of the absolute worst things that ever happened to the church of Jesus Christ was it became the official religion of the world. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Because we just read from the Apostle Paul that the goal is to get out there and to testify the good news of God's grace. But for much of the last 2,000 years, that testifying to the good news of God's grace has been as soldiers marching under the banner of a cross turned into a sword. The hope for the church of Jesus Christ going forward is that we march out not as soldiers, but as servants. Servants of the servant. Amen. As we do prepare now to come to the table, why don't you take those hymnals out? We'll sing a song of, of preparation. We're going to sing actually the very first song that's in our hymnal. Number one, Rise, Shine, You People.
It's now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life following the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways are invited to draw near with faith and to receive this holy sacrament. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, invites us to this holy communion through which he will give himself to us and lead us into a deeper fellowship with one another. Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let us pray. Divine and merciful creator, as we gather before you to partake in this sacred communion, we come with hearts filled with humility, recognizing our unworthiness to stand in your presence and yet in your boundless love. You invite us to your table, not because of our merit, but because of your grace. In this moment, we reflect on the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. Your son, Jesus Christ, who humbly laid down his life out of love for humanity. May his example inspire us to follow in his footsteps, to surrender our desires and our ambitions, and to embrace the path of selflessness and service. As we partake of the bread, his body broken for us, in the cup, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, may we be reminded again of the immense love that you have lavished upon us. Let this communion be a tangible expression of our commitment to love one another as you have loved us. Grant us, Lord, the strength to set aside our pride and our ego, to humble ourselves before you and our fellow human beings. May this act of communion be a catalyst for reconcilia reconciliation among us, breaking down barriers and fostering a spirit of compassion and empathy. And as we leave this sacred space later today, may we carry with us the essence of this communion, a heart overflowing with humility, a willingness to sacrifice for the sake of others, and a deep-seated love that transcends all boundaries. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus, who has given us these words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they're delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just a reminder, we will pass uh, first the bread through the pews, and please wait until everyone has received, and then we will eat the bread together, and then we will do the same with the cup. Will the servers please come forward?
Christ, which is broken for you. Take and eat. closing hymn number 680 and if you're able I invite you to stand and sing.
Quick reminder, if you uh, would go out into the fellowship hall and grab some refreshments and say a quick hello to everyone, and then come on back in here to the sanctuary and we'll start up our annual meeting in about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and thank you for those that can stay and be a part of that. Receive now the benediction as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you.